Um, my talk today is entitled The Rise and Fall of the Equal Rights Amendment, or ERA. So the ERA, or Equal Rights Amendment, was first proposed in 1922 by a group of suffragists seeking to build on the momentum of the passage of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution, guaranteeing women the right to vote. The 19th Amendment was that marked a culmination of nearly 75 years of women's activism, which began in 1848 at the Seneca Falls Convention. With the vote achieved, activists turned their attention to sex-based discrimination in the law. ERA proponents argued that the proper strategy, as was the case with suffrage, would be a constitutional amendment that affirmed men and women be treated equally under the law. The ERA stated simply, equality of rights under the law sh shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Yet, the amendment was defeated, both in the 1920s and decisively in the late 1970s, early 1980s. And in each case, it was women who spearheaded that defeat. Yet interestingly, in the 1920s, it was progressive women on the left who opposed the ERA. In the 1970s, it was conservative women on the right. So in my brief remarks today, I want to unpack the controversy surrounding the ERA, both in the 1920s and in the 1970s. Why was an amendment seemingly as innocuous as the Equal Rights Amendment which by the 1970s had strong support from a diversity of women's groups, as well as from both Republican and Democratic lawmakers, ultimately defeated. Moreover, what does the ERA controversy tell us about differing views among feminists and women more broadly regarding the social significance of gender and the meaning of equality? What do failures like the ERA illuminate about constitutional history and how the law should treat differences created by the fact that women have different reproductive systems. Does equality mean that men and women should be treated the same? Or does equality require different treatment under the law? These questions are central not only to Americans' women's history and to the history of modern American feminism, but also fundamental to legal and constitutional history as well, and remain relevant today. So in 1922, the National Women's Party, which I'm gonna to refer to as the NWP, first proposed the Equal Rights Amendment as the only sensible strategy for women's rights activists to pursue following the ratification of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution in August of 1920. The NWP was a very small group, engaging perhaps only 5% of all suffragists, and it was founded in 1913 by Alice Paul and Lucy Burns as a more militant alternative to the much larger National American Women's Suffrage Association, or NASA. The NWP first formed to pursue, precisely to pursue, a federal strategy for achieving the vote. And this was in contrast to the state-by-state -state approach that NASA had long been advocating. In the 19-teens, the NWP became renowned for its partisan tactics and also for its flamboyant publicity-generating actions, which included parades, pickets in front of the White House, placards in Congress, and hunger strikes in jail. And so successful was the NWP in getting the attention of the American public that NASA actually shifted its focus to a federal um, constitutional amendment as well in 1916. And in no, large, in no small part because of the success that the NWP was generating. So in 1921, following a women's rights convention where a multitude of women met to sort of discuss, well, what do we do next, right? The 19th Amendment has passed. How do we continue women's activism? That particular convention was mostly controlled by the NWP, and that's where they proposed this idea of an equal rights amendment, right? And they were sort of reasoning, well, we just got a constitutional amendment for the right to vote. It makes complete sense to get a constitutional amendment basically declaring that men and women should be treated equally under the law. Seems simple enough. 
But this notion of equal rights under the law proved a much thornier issue to define, implement, and unify activists around than suffrage had ever been. The vast majority of suffragists, in fact, opposed the Equal Rights Amendment from the get-go. Why, right? Why were groups as diverse as the National Women's Trade Union, the American Association of University Women, the YWCA, and the League of Women's Voters hostile to the ERA? Why did most women reformers um, view the amendment's proponents as traitors to the cause of what activists then referred to as organized womanhood? While there are a host of reasons, some activists objected to the brash tactics of the NWP, Alice Paul, and the cult of personality that developed around her. Still, others championed a more conservative approach to the advancement of women's rights, preferring a gradual change to the blanket approach of a constitutional amendment. But by far, the greatest resistance to the ERA came from progressive women on the left, who worried that such a clean sweep approach to discrimination would invalidate a wide range of labor and health legislation that they had tirelessly worked to pass in the, de the previous decades. So they feared, in short, that the ERA would nullify the sex-based labor legislation, things like laws regulating women's hours, wages, and conditions to work, which women's trade unionists and labor reformers had worked so hard to achieve between the 1890s um, and the 1920s, a period that w witnessed rapid industrialization and a surge of female activism in response to that industrialization. Um, some scholars even refer to this period of the Gilded Age of the Progressive Era as a maternal commonwealth, kind of referring to, to the upsurge of female activism. So the passage of such social and uh, labor legislation in the United States had been difficult to say the least, in large part because of the conservatism of the judiciary, especially the Supreme Court at the turn of the century. In 1905, the Supreme Court ruled in Lochner v. New York that a state law limiting the workday to 10 hours for those employed in bakeries was unconstitutional. The rationale behind the law was that longer hours were unhealthy, tending to promote tuberculosis and other disease diseases, which were then passed on to customers who came and bought bread from the bakers. The court's opinion held, however, that hours could not be regulated um, unless the worker himself was, in, was uh, working in unhealthy conditions, such as in coal mines. So otherwise, the terms of the contract between employers and employees could not be regulated. So women trade unionists, labor reformers, responded to the 1905 Lochner decision by pursuing a strategy of obtaining court approval for minimum hour legislation specifically for women. They argued successfully in Mueller versus Oregon in 1908 that hours for women working in manufacturing could be constitutionally limited since sociological evidence demonstrated that women's health was injured when they labored for longer than 10 hours. The Mueller decision in fact set the precedent for the 1917 ruling in Bunting versus Oregon in which the court ruled that, states, that state laws limiting working hours to 10 hour and day were in fact constitutional for both men and women. Yet by the early 1920s, the Supreme Court seemed to reject this gender-based approach, which helped fuel feminist antipathy towards the ERA. In 1923, the court ruled in Atkins v. Children's Hospital that minimum wage laws for, women's, for women were unconstitutional because the 19th Amendment demonstrated that men and women were equal and therefore women did not need special legislation. Activists feared that the ERA would further stymie such attempts at passing legislation specifically for women, which was actually part of a larger strategy among these progressives for um, a way of advancing class goals and gender and, and equity um, and improving conditions for both men and women alike. So at the heart of the dispute of the ERA in the 1920s, was whether to pursue a strategy for women's advancement based on women's difference from men or on women's similarities to men. 
Many within the suffrage movement's mainstream, along with women trade unionists and labor reformers, supported notions of difference to justify women's political goals and activism. This strategy of maternalism, whereby so-called social feminists emphasize gender difference as a means of obtaining legislation to enhance the lives of poor women, conflicted with the strategy of ERA proponents and so-called liberal feminists who embraced a more radical for the time notion of gender um, sameness uh, and equality between the sexes. And critics argued that the, the, the strategy of focusing on this, this idea of sameness would actually mostly benefit only professional middle class women at the expense of working class uh, women and the working class more generally. So not surprisingly, Congress rejected the ERA in 1923. With little support among women, it languished for decades. Um, it briefly emerged as an issue in 1945, but it really didn't come back to the forefront until the 1960s. And it was the surge of liberal reform, I think today actually marks the 50th anniversary of LBJ's war on poverty. But it was the surge of liberal reform in the 1960s that really changed the prospect of passing the ERA. By 1970, the pro proposed amendment enjoyed wide support among women's groups, many of which had previously opposed it. This switch in attitude towards the ERA, especially among labor and working class groups, flowed directly from the profound changes in the place and prospects of women in the labor for force during this period. Equal access to all occupations and equal pay for equal work were the most widely supported elements of the feminist agenda, and the ERA appeared just the tool to ensure economic justice for women. In 1970, President Richard Nixon endorsed it. Um, it was also endorsed by a slew of Republican um, senators, including, including Strom Thurmond. In March of 1972, the ERA easily passed both houses of Congress, and within a year, 30 of the necessary 38 states had ratified the amendment. Victory seemed imminent. So few women at the time and few observers at the time could sort of foresee the conservative backlash that was about to emerge um, towards the ERA. So, Enter onto the scene Phyllis Schlafly. In 1972, Schlafly organized an extraordinarily successful grassroots campaign to stop more states from ratifying the ERA. One of the most important female conservatives and arguably conservatives in modern American history, Schlafly first made a name for herself when she wrote the book A Choice Not an Echo in support of Barry Goldwater's nomination for the 1964 Republican presidential nomination. In that book, she argued that Eastern elite, i.e. moderate Republicans, had taken over the party, were controlling the party, and at, at the expense of conservative principles of things like limited government and a strong national defense. Schlafly's book sold over three million copies, a tremendous amount, and contributed to Goldwater winning the nomination in 1964. And despite the fact that Goldwater was trounced in the election by LBJ, both of those things, Schlafly's book and, and Goldwater's nomination, sort of indicated a changing shift within the Republican Party. It indicated sort of the rise of this conservative movement um, within the party. This conservative movement came to be known as the New Right. Partly that was a play on the New Left of the 1960s. Um, and the New Right had many strands, but grassroots conservative women played a major role. These women, most of them ordinary homemakers, many living in sort of the new locales of the Sun Belt, places like Arizona, Southern California that were rising to prominence during this period, mostly white, mostly devoutly Christian, and many of them mothers, had first actually become politically active in the 1950s and early 1960s, partly because of fear of communist infiltration of their communities, particularly in schools. But by the 1970s, their political activism had shifted from a focus on anti-communism and more to uh, social issues. Schlafly became their leader, and they organized under her newly formed organization, STOP ERA, all in capitals, and it stood for Stop Taking Our Privileges. These conservative women felt marginalized by the feminist upsurge of the era, 
and were appalled by the changing cultural norms brought about by the social movements of the 1960s and the sexual revolution more broadly. So unlike second wave feminists, these conservative activists became politically active, not to upend what Betty Friedan had termed the feminine mystique, um, a term she coined in her 1963 best-selling book of the same title. The feminine mystique referred to a set of cultural ideals that Friedan argued permeated American society after World War II, and which defined a woman's identity solely as a wife and mother. And in Friedan's view, that was at the expense of her individual identity and ability to find um, herself in a career. So conservative women, on the other hand, didn't buy into the feminine mystique. And in fact, they mobilized behind conservatism while accepting and even leveraging their traditional feminine roles. They believed that the ERA would undermine what they and other conservatives would soon term traditional family values. So while progressives of the 1920s opposed the ERA because they believed it would invalidate gender-specific legislation, conservative women in the 1970s rallied against it because they feared the ERA would erode fundamental gender distinctions. Schlafly famously charged that the ERA would forbid separate men and female bathrooms, that it would perilously, perilously extend the draft to women, something that proved true anyways, regardless that of the ERA, and insisted that instead of ending sex discrimination, the ERA would deprive women of crucial privileges, such as the expectation that their husband would support them economically. Yet, as the scholar Joe Freeman has noted, the real effects of equalizing legal rights were largely lost in the debate. In the 1920s and even more in the 1970s, the ERA was the quintessential symbolic issue. For conservative women, the ERA embodied all that was wrong with liberalism and the social movements of the 1960s. So by lobbying forcefully in crucial state legislatures, Schlafly and her Stop ERA activists slowed the pace of the ratification of the ERA to a crawl. Feminists fought back, but to no avail. In 1977, Indiana was the 35th and last state to ratify the amendment. Though Congress extended the period for ratification by four years, it made no difference. In 1982, the ERA went down in defeat. Um, and just for the record, Oklahoma never voted to uh, ratify it. So to conclude, the ERA controversy gives us a window into how gender and the law intersect and how complicated that issue is. Are women the same or are they different than men? And what does equality between the genders entail? The ERA battle also complicates the notion of women, right, as being one unified category, um, or sisterhood, as second wave feminists somewhat naively termed it. Um, both in the 1920s and the 1970s, debates about the ERA revealed that women were not unified by gender and that categories like class, race, religion, among others, were equally central to their identities and worldviews. Yet gender is critical to understanding American history and I think that you could particularly see that in the 20th century. And though we generally learn about winners, not lost causes in history, I hope the case of the ERA has illuminated the important intersections between gender and legal and constitutional thought. Thank you. Freedom 101 is made possible by generous support from the University of Oklahoma Alumni Association. Freedom 101 is a program of the Institute for the American Constitutional Heritage at the University of Oklahoma. For more videos and podcasts, visit freedom.ou.edu.